Hi, my name is Grant Graves, and we're going to talk about lobster. It's timely. The season's open, but not everywhere because of some neurotoxins in some of the lobster, which we'll cover with the latter part of the thing. So I thought I would go over some basics on lobster habitat, morphologies, things like that, and some interesting facts. We're not a huge group, but it's a big group. So feel free to come off mute and ask questions or drop stuff in chat. Barbara will be monitoring chat. It's a little hard when I'm sharing to do that, but we'll do our best and we'll stick around at the end. If you have any burning questions that you don't want to ask in front of the whole group, that's fine. But I'm wholly welcoming to any question. There are no dumb questions, only dumb answers provided by me. And hopefully most of those will be intelligible of some sort. Anyway, let me share the deck. There's mainly pictures. And we should be seeing spiny lobster, penny lettuce, and domoic acid. Yes? Yes. Thank you. So, now if you see this, you're a lucky, lucky human, because this is what we call a glory hole. That's a whole lot of lobster, and there's a lot of big ones in there. They are social critters, so... So you will run into this from occasion, and it kind of depends on how they how they travel and making travel quite distances. But we are here to talk about bugs, as we euphemistically call them, or the California spiny lobster. So they're definitely social. They hang out in groups. Often there's a dominant male and a whole lot of harems of females. And one of the things about the recreational and commercial take is in some ways, for smaller males, it helps them because it removes some of the bigger males from the population. But the dynamic population dynamics change, and we'll talk about some of the history as we go along. They're slower growth growing than you than you're imagining, and they're much older than you think. I don't really take anything over five pounds anymore if and when I hunt because the bigger animals can brood a lot more eggs and sperm, and are way way more productive. Our fungun fungundity, <laughs> I have trouble with that word. Our ability to reproduce is is exponentially larger than some of the small ones. And we'll go over some of those specifics in a little bit. But a big 15-pound lobster that I used to take back in the 80s is probably as old as your grandparents. So I tend not to do that anymore. Oops, I'm on the slide. And they can get really, really big. This was it would be something I would affectionately call Lobzilla. Uh, I've seen bigger ones than that. That's probably around 10 pounds. They I've seen 15 to 18 pound lobster back in the day. And then way back in the 60s and 50s, you could find stuff like this in the tide pools. There are pictures of piles of lobster before there were no take limits at like Leo Carrillo, that guys went in low tide and pulled out of the tide pools along with a whole bunch of abalone, which that fishery has been closed down here for approaching 30 years. So they can get impressively large. And sometimes back in the day when I'd wrestle with one of these big, big boys or girls, sometimes you'd wonder if you'd win. But the interesting thing is if you grab them and brought them to your chest, They'd wrap around your whole chest and tend to hang on. So once they kind of gave up the fight, they didn't fight much more. But again, we try to leave these go because they produce so well. So a little bit about the bits and pieces. So it's in a group. It's, lobster are part of a group called arthropods, the phylum. And those are the same as insects. And orthropod means armored leg, and they're an exoskeleton-based organism or animal. And that's why they're hard, because they have a, a shell. And that shell is made of a protein and calcium. And oftentimes, this time of year, they tend to have molted or shed that skin, and that's the only way they can grow. But the cool piece about that is that it allows them to regenerate missing pieces as well. So that carapace or the outer coating will be soft underneath. They'll create a new one. They'll actually, and we'll look at some molds later, 
they'll actually come out between the fissure of the of the of the thorax of the carapace and the tail and swim out backwards and they are soft shell lobster so this time of year generally and sometimes other parts of the year you might grab one and it feels soft you freak freak out you let go of it and it swims away that same way we get soft shell crabs they do the same thing a little bit of different uh, morphology there but if you look at the number of legs they're five on each side they have other modified appendages but they are in a group called deca poda and what's the root deca or deck or desi mean yes 10 10 legs so that's what makes them characteristic here you could they're, they're symmetrical down the middle so you could fold both sides of the picture kind of over and they would line up. And then if you're into lobster, you'll notice that the big antenna are usually what they feel. They have little all the little marks or little hairs. They can taste with that and feel with that. So if you're calm and mellow, especially during the day, and you kind of, I come down sometimes and wiggle my fingers and the tips of the lobster uh, antenna will come out and they don't bolt right away if you're not a threat. And they'll sit there and, interact with your fingers as long as you don't rush on them and be very interested. So they're, they're curious and it's very interesting actually. And then we have some attenuals, which are out in front and are more sensory. And we'll look at the underside where the mouth parts are. So we have the cephalothorax or the carapace, which is that middle section. We have the abdomen or often known as the tail. And then the tail is a very interesting structure, which we'll look at. And when we flip it over, these items are what allow you to sex the lobster, and there are males and female lobster. So this is a photograph. You'll see here the top and the tail spread out. And then on the right, you'll see the bottom view. Is that a male or a female, do you think? Male. Female? It's male because these are called pleopeds and they're very small. The males have very small ones. And also at the base of the final legs, you'll see kind of where their sperm ducts are. And the, you can't really see it, but their hind legs have little adapted claws on them to help pass those packets to the female. So some of the parts, this is a good comparison of male and female. They're Relative from the top, they look very, very similar. Females have a grooming claw, males have the genital pore, and then when they lay eggs, the female retains them generally with the pleopeds that are bigger. And that you'll see bright orange row. So, I do not, I do not, it's not illegal to take females with row. I like to leave them until they're row free because we want more lobster, right? So these pleopeds are in segments, in pairs, and they'll fan and, and nurture the eggs, and then their eggs will be attached in this area. And then slight differences in the widths of the tail and things like that. But the tail is very powerful. That's why all that meat's there, why we get to eat it. On the bigger lobster, the claws and the antenna are filled with a lot of meat, so don't throw that away. And you can use a rolling pin to roll that meat out or crack it like, like crab. If it's very big, it, it's very sweet and big meat. So don't discard those, but we'll talk about what you want to eat these days if the acid levels are high. And then on the males, you oftentimes will see a bit of a gray patch kind of next to the genital pores. And that's, they've kind of put their sperm packages out on their abdomen to have it readily accessible to transfer to a female. It's a little morphology of them. Then you can see a bit of the mouth parts in here. These are kind of modified antennae as well. These help feed things into what look like munching maxilla in there. And if you get a chance, it's very, very interesting to look at the mouth parts. But they're pretty voracious. I would never recommend having a lobster in a, in a tank unless you want only lobster. Because they will eat everything. <laughs> and you got to feed them a lot to keep them from eating everything. So... Uh, they're very fond of mussels and things like that, but they will eat almost anything. They're scavengers. 
So when I was in marine biology in high school, we catch some lobster and keep them around and then eat them at the end of the semester. And they're, they denuded the tank, like nothing lived in them, even like sea fans, they would eventually eat if they didn't have food they wanted. So the interesting thing is when they molt, they create this new shell underneath. They can, they'll begin to regenerate lost limbs from divers that uh, munch them up a bit and not grow the whole thing back, but gain each time they molt. So the older they are, the less they molt. So the more impacted they are by a loss of a limb. And it just takes a lot more energy for a 20 pound lobster or 10 pound lobster to regenerate all the stuff where the teeny little like brand new ones may molt every week. And uh, legal lobster are probably molting a couple times a year, if not three. We'll talk about how old they are when they do that. So here's some images, not very high res. But you can see on the far right, we have Ro. And she has returned a uh, sperm patch here where she's collected a lot and she's holding it in reserve to fertilize eggs, and it's often not just one male. And then the males are a bit free, and they have a bit of different morphology. And you can see she has a bit of a round spot around her base of her legs, and it's a diamond or a Star Trek, upside-down Star Trek emblem for the males. So that's another interesting uh, type difference. I recommend that you don't retain females in season that have the row. Let them go. They're probably going to release very soon and you can catch them at the end of the season and hopefully we have a sustained lobster population does anybody remember what the limit bag limit was when we first had a bag limit for lobster 10 10 it was 10 per day then not fairly long ago now they went to seven and before they went to seven we had good years and bad years there was really kind of piecemeal since it's gone to seven it's been pretty sustainable like if you hit the right spots you can limit out relatively quickly there tends to be population throughout the whole year and then there's again the next year so probably a good move seems to be working and we'll see what happens in the future but here's a it's this is from california fish and game these are various studies that talk about when male and female lobster hit sexual maturity and then when they're legal and there's quite a range here but on the low end, they say four to seven years for legality on an 83 study. The 92 study says six and a half, eight and a half. It goes as high as 11 and 13. So, and you, you look at maturity, most of these studies are showing that we're only giving them four or five years, three or four years, depending on the study, to reproduce a few times. And remember, their numbers of reproduction when they're only a pound is much, much less than the 15 pounder, right? So this is pretty interesting. I tend to take like two to four pounds if I find them. I'll take some just legal because they're nice size for sharing and for cooking. But I leave the big ones because they, I forget what the estimates are, but thousands of times it's just legal. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Any questions about the age? So most people don't understand that when you're grabbing a legal lobster, they're probably six to eight years old. If they're a pound, pound and a half, two pounds. If they're bigger than that, it slows down in the growth rate. So what they'll do is they create that new carapace. They come out, they regenerate some pieces, not fully if it's bad. Like loss of an antenna will take probably three moltings to come back. They swell up with seawater once they're soft. Then they harden that carapace that's mainly protein called chitin, and they lay in carb uh, calcium carbonate. They make it hard. Then they shrink back down and grow into that new shell. So it's pretty darn cool. So they're creating a suit of armor, and their structure on the outside creates very robust creates very robust protection. If you've ever grabbed a lobster, they're very strong, and they are pretty pr they're prickly, but they don't have claws here. But they're, they're super fast and they have pretty robust protections and they have spines on them. And if you're, you ever grabbed a lobster barehanded, you probably paid for it for a few days because 
it can rip up your hands pretty well. We usually use some sort of neoprene or leather palm type of gloves when we hunt them. This is not a pro hunting. It's fine if you don't want to take hunting. I, I tend to eat vegetables most of the time, but I have friends that enjoy lobster and I, I still enjoy respectful and sustainable hunting. I'd much rather get it myself than buy it from the store. And there's not a lot of bycatch in lobster fisheries, but the traps can entangle whales and when they're abandoned, you know, pollute the ground and turn into a rusty metal trap that can continue to trap things if left in place. And some lobsters, once things break down, like living in that kind of structure, we'll talk about their habitat in a minute. Any questions about size and age? So legal lobsters slightly over a pound, around a pound. They tend to be six to eight to 10 years old, depending on who you believe. I've always gone, kind of gone with the six year-ish, six to eight years. So they're toddlers, essentially. No other tweens, I guess, preteens. And then as they get bigger, it slows down and they can be very, very, very old. And it's estimated that some of those over 10 pounders, 15 pounder lobzillas truly are 60, 70, 80 years old. And I, I've never heard that there's a maximum lifespan for lobster, but eventually some disease or predator will end up grabbing them. But I've seen some pretty darn big ones, especially on the breakwaters and things like that. So one interesting thing about lobster, has anybody heard them make noise? Any lobster hunters here? Come off mute or uh, Yeah, I've seen I've heard it make noise. Who is this, please? Oh, sorry. Hey Grant, it's Brant didn't. Hey, hey Brant. How's it going? Yeah, they kind of make a yeah. kind of noise. And you'll hear it on the reef. And sometimes if I don't see them at night, I'll hear them and I'll look closer and find them because they're making noise. But they'll communicate, <laughs> and then when you catch them and you have them in the bag or when you grab them, it gets really rapid and fast, doesn't it? So they are warning their fellow lobster. And at the base of the antenna, you have this flap. Pel pel yeah, ple plectrum. And a, a kind of a smooth area, a file area, and it rubs back and forth, and that's what makes that kind of almost bow sound, that whoop, whoop. Well, it's created at the base of the antenna. So they, they, they're they communal, right? They like to be social most of the time. kind of depends. They'll also be with other species, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute. And those species you may think are buddies and, oh, it's so cute. It's so cool that they hang out. Yeah, most of the species are waiting for the molt when they're soft so they can eat them. So it's not so cute. However, there's some commensal uh, symbiosis there we can talk about more. So, and there's kind of these hairs in there. They're well nerved so they could, like they play their song, right? It's literally an instrument that's built into them. And they have good nerve, good control and good awareness of what they're actually doing. So there are long stroke, short strokes. I haven't read any studies on the music of California Spiding Lobster, but there's probably some room for some research there. Of, you know, what are they doing? Are there patterns? Are they playing songs? Are there notes? Or is it just kind of random? That I don't have enough data on to share with you, but it is a very interesting question. And if anybody knows, come off mute or turn me on to someone who does, because I've always been curious about that since I was a teenager. Any questions about their music? And sound travels pretty far in water. So it is, if you get really quiet or you're free diving or you're on a rebreather, it's a little unfair, but still legal. You actually can hear them from quite a bit away. And sometimes I think, oh, there's no bugs here, but I hear them. Maybe the visit is a little poor. And then I'll tend to put a little more time into that area. I'm hearing a bit of, uh, 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 uh. it's more of a raspy kind of grinding sound than that. That was kind of more of a blacksmith sound. <laughs> so this is the molting process. You can see they've split. It's split between the carapace or the cephalothorax and the abdomen or the tail. And this 
they, if you ever see them molt, and we've seen them in the aquariums a few times, they kind of swim and push their way out. And they're soft, so there's some flexibility in it. And then they'll swim out. And when they land, they're super soft. So you can see the antennas aren't straightened yet. And you could grab this or touch this. It's very, very spongy. And it it's literally almost a little stiffer than the meat itself. So if you ever touch a raw lobster, that's this is what it almost feels like, except that it's got a little stiffer protein with that chitin shell on top of it. And when you lay in heavier protein and calcium carbonate, it can get very strong, as you know, if you've ever touched a non-molted, you know, growing pre-molt lobster or picked up a molt. So oftentimes when it's a lot of these communities at certain ages will molt all at the same time and you'll see all these quote unquote dead lobster. There's so many dead lobster. Oh no, it's not generally dead. So if you pick them up and it splits between the cephalothorax or the carapace and the abdomen or the tail, it's not dead. It's just the remains of the old suit that didn't fit anymore. So it's busy growing its new suits. Okay, John, thanks. So some of the territory for the lobster that's around, it's mainly a Southern California below point conception type of thing. They do range all the way up to Monterey and then all the way down into Baja. And then the darker the color, the bigger the take is with the lobster in a commercial sense. So this is where data exists. And you can see they're very productive around most of the Channel Islands and in our area here. And then this area down here by PV is part of the closure, which we'll look at in a little bit in a few minutes. Any questions about the range? So you will see them hang out. This is a bunch of very baby lobster and a larger lobster hang out with a moray eel. Moray eels don't see great, but they smell very well. And they're not buddies. This moray eel. The second this lobster molts, that he, that more able to eat them. So it provides some, in the meantime, some mutual goings on and support of each other. But once that once that lobster molts, they tend to hide because they're very soft and they they are very aware of their vulnerability, and are generally not in the traditional spots you find the other lobster because that's where predators expect them to be. So what I find a lot in the eelgrass, the phyllospadex, the surf grass that you see in the kind of in, in the shallows when they're shallow this time of year. And they'll be even during the day hanging out in cracks and crevices around that surf grass, kind of trying to hide till they firm up a bit. And then they'll move back to their holes. And during the day, they're nocturnal animals. So they come out at night. Generally, as the sun goes down, they get more active. They come out, they eat. I like to dive later in the day if I'm hunting for them because they tend to, I find them a little slower once they've eaten something. So generally 10, 11, midnight, one o'clock, they're out kind of hanging around, but they're not as busy and as hyper. They kind of a little food, food drunk, I guess. And they'll come out at night and scavenge almost anything, invertebrates, mussels, dead fish, you know, things that have been killed or have died. They'll eat almost anything. And during the day, they, they go under the rocks into a hole like this. And generally they really, really like a hole that has a front door and a back door. So if you're hunting today, it's a lot more work. The colors aren't as pretty because you're bringing your own light at night. However, they generally stay put in one spot. So I always look, if I find a nice hole with a couple bugs in it, I'll look for a back door or way they like to come out, kind of block it with a stone, and then it's a pretty easy get. But if you miss them up front and you haven't blocked, blocked, blocked the back door or it's a big glory hole that goes in multiple directions, once you lose them up front, they're probably long gone because they're very quick and they'll go multiple yards away when they swim backwards. And they can jump forwards too. So often I'll go for the middle of the carapace, try to not breathe as heavy and shine my light away at night and try to get close to the middle and grab for the middle. So a little bit about doemic acid. Here's the closure for recreational diving. It's down by Palos Verdes, kind of the Huntington Beach. The these are no, the pink and the orange, sorry, pink and blue are no-take and protected zones anyway. 
And then the orange is definitely closed. It's still currently closed. And then the green is kind of a warning area that you may be at risk of finding some heavy domoic acid. And this is right now the only place they've found that. We've asked Fish and Game if the test levels in Malibu, we want to know if it was close or not at all. And they really didn't tell us. And even in this area, the test, one lobster was over the threshold, which is 20 parts per million. It's mainly, we'll cover that in a second, but only one of the six sampled had it in it to a threshold that caused the closure. So the odds are, since it comes from plankton blooms, which we'll talk about more in a sec, we're not having more right now, and the water's cooling, odds are we won't have more. So when it opens, it should likely stay open. And then the commercial one, they've pretty much closed all of it just out of safety. So right now, no lobster take for commercial or for recreational down around PV down to Huntington Beach. Any questions about the closure itself? So the nasty little species, which is actually a diatom, and there's 50 different actual species. The genus is Pseudo uh, Nitsichia. Nitsichia. So it's these needle-like diatoms, which is actually a green algae. I had assumed it was a dinoflagellate, but it is not. So it's not a typical red tide bioluminescent blue light at night. Red tide, but who remembers what was happening in June with our animal, our mammal friends? Oh, all the sea lions and seals that were yeah, sea lions and harbor seals and such. Do you remember what the news was about? Well, it was the bacteria from the bloom, right? It wasn't bacteria. It was actually oh. domoic acid. Or was inhalation oh, and the fish and invertebrates. So what happens? Lobster like mussels a lot, and mussels are filter feeders, and they do what's called bioaccumulation. So they'll filter everything out of the water, and they keep this species and eat it, and the toxins from it. About half of them, there are fifty species around the world. About half of them have toxic at the that toxic neurogenic neurotoxic acid in it, and the other half don't. But this, the blooms we had had this type of diatom in it. It bioaccumulated in the fish and the invertebrates, and they ate it. And there were a lot of domoic acid poisoned or shellfish poisoned, as it's known, marine mammals around. So that's where this came from. So the lobster running around eating this stuff that accumulated in June and July. And I think we had some blooms in August as well. So it's not that long ago. And it takes a while to work itself out. And that's why they, what is the saying for bivalves and things like that? Don't take them in a month with uh, R, I think. It's due to the, the, the plankton. But just read your fishing game closures if you're going to gather uh, filter feeding animals too. And then things that eat those animals by accumulate even more because they're eating multiple versions of it. And up the food chain, it gets worse, and then it's so dense that it can really make them sick. And it can make us sick. That's why they've closed it. And it's a neurogenic toxin, which means you just kind of can't breathe. It paralyzes your nerves. And there's some really nasty versions of it. But it can be within 30 to 20, 30 minutes, 24 hours. Mild cases, you have vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramps, headache, dizziness. And then at worst, you can have severe cases where you have trouble breathing, confusion, disorientation. So all your nerve controls can go haywire. And it doesn't go away right away. And it can cause long or short-term memory known as amnesic shellfish poisoning, which I hadn't heard of until I researched this. And it can cause coma or death, generally due to respiratory distress and shutdown. And it's the threshold for the closure is 20 parts per million. In the lobster, it tends to be in their viscera. And California has a very interesting thing. We test our wild seafood and have been doing so for almost 100 years. 1927 was the first time when they started the process. 
because there's paralytic shellfish poisoning from muscle consumption, it hit 100 people. So this is not a new problem. It is new for the recreational fishery, but it's it's not new in the commercial lobster fishery, which I didn't know as well. So the lobsters accumulate, and I'd always thought they don't accumulate in their meat. It's possible, but they generally don't. But it's in the viscera eggs and other parts. So even if it's higher and you pull the tail, discard the cook. So we don't want to make soups or lobster bisque with any of these high level animals you're not allowed to take it when it's closed but if it's say in the warning zone or you're worried about it in malibu just cook the tail don't don't use the carapace to make bisque and stick to the meat itself i still haven't gotten a level for what's going on in malibu but we can assume it's definitely below threshold and it's probably much lower but no one's talking about it. And if we get data, we can update that in an email, I imagine. So uh, this the, they test every week. And on September 25th, one of the six sample lobsters was above threshold. So uh, it will probably open, but it may take a while for the levels to reduce. And also a bit of randomness to the sampling, right? So when I asked kind of what's the origin story for the, the recreational take, the response from fishing game was there was never, there's never been a recreational lobster fishery delay due to demoic acid previously. There have been commercial fishery closures and delays in the past. And the last was in the Channel Islands five or six years ago. And it's unclear exactly why this year is different, but he brings up the marine mammal stuff of the summer with dolf the dolphin sickness and dolphins and sea lions. So we did have some large, algae blooms this year but it doesn't always re result in this but I, I i think if you remember the beginning of covid we had all the bioluminescence at night and that summer we had sick sea lions and dolphins as well not as publicized but that's a good indicator so if summer you have big heavy sickness and not starvation based issues with juvenile sea lions but sea lions and dolphins getting sick, they expect there's probably going to be some demonic acid around. The threshold for crab is 30 parts per million, and I'm not quite sure why <laughs> the difference exists. Hey, Grant? Yes. So I just want to point out, when I, I was talking to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, their invertebrate expert, you know, he said that they are testing Malibu and that they didn't come back with anything above 20. Okay. Right, but so, we don't know how close to 20 it is is the issue. So I, I'm trying to figure out what yeah. numbers are saying. No, and we're still trying to get some data points on that. But one thing I would like to point out is, you know, they were getting reports of really sick sea lions and seals up in Santa Barbara, right, when this was all happening. Well, guess what? We were having the same thing happening in Malibu, but nobody yep. was talking about it. So just because it isn't reported, I just want to remind people, that, you know, no lobster is worth getting sick over, right? Especially, you know, this could kill you guys. You know, it's it's an interesting thing that's happening, but, you know, it's it's not worth taking a risk right now. And the good news is, is- uh, I, I don't want to fear, I, I, we're recording this. So I want to be very clear. I don't want to fear monger. No, lobster, I'm not fear lobster, mongering. Okay, lobster off from Malibu are legal and safe to take. Yeah. No mistake. From what we know right now, that's true, right? But yeah. for me personally, this is just my opinion, you know, um, the good news is, is that, you know, once it's been cleared, this clears it out of its body. You know, it's not like, you know, that there's an ongoing issue, right? It's yeah. like- it's not, it's not like lead or mercury that sticks around forever. Correct. So if you're going to hunt, you got to carry a gauge with you. You got to have your license readily available doesn't have to be in a ziplock on you and you have to have a caliper gauge anybody know the distance the caliper gauge is three and a quarter inches and you go between the horns and it's it should not include the margin of the carapace or the cephalothorax this one is quite legal probably a year or two oh probably two years over legal but that much extra 
So there is a question in the chat about whether there's a source. So if you're able to go down to the app, but if it's if there's any gap at all, let it go. And our bag limit is seven per day. You can get multi-day permits of two to three days, but you have to apply for them ahead of time. Or if you're on a boat, ask because they have to apply for it. And then you can, they, they believe there's up to a three-day continuous limit of 21. And in theory, you're not even supposed to possess over those limits in your freezer. So be aware of that. We used to do Pepperdine classes and Pepperdine parties. And we cook a bunch of lobster for 30 or 40 kids. And what I was doing was not within the regulations, actually. Same for Avalonia if they reopen up north, by the way. So I was thought, I'll go up and do three or four days and bring them home. Well, if I get caught with that in my thermos, that's illegal. So thank you very much. Happy to answer questions. Do we have any chat questions, Barbara? Grant, this is Sarah. I have a question. Yeah. So when you when you cook a lobster, especially when you put it in boiling water, it screams. It's uh, not screaming. It's usually escaping gases, or it can make <laughs> noise with the the horns. They have no mechanism to scream. So, so if you're humanitarian about it and you you're nervous, or that makes you nervous, or you don't, they will they can flop around uh, because they realize it's hot water. But like a frog, if you put them in warm water and heat, uh, Luke air temperature water and heat it up they will probably not notice it but they freeze and go to sleep so if you want to do it in a more humane process freezing them they just kind of go to sleep and they die and you can thaw them again or you can boil them frozen and it just takes a little longer so they're not screaming in pain it's just the gases that are escaping i'm not saying they don't feel pain every animal has nerves that helps it stay alive you know, it's a, that's a much bigger question and a philosophical one. What we can consider pain for us may not be what they experience, but I guarantee you they're, they're not enjoying themselves probably. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm vegan most of the time, so I can make that ethical argument. And some of that has to do with how we harvest and sustain our proteins. But I, I, I will have lobster if I really want to. And this year I, I was looking forward to kind of mastering a lobster bis recipe for friends and myself. That's the one thing I still enjoy. I've eaten thousands of lobster in my life. So the particular animal itself by itself is not high on my list. I'm kind of over it, but I, I do like it as an ingredient for all my cooking. Thank you. No worries. So Grant, I'm not aware of any source for the testing levels that's published publicly. They referred us to public health. I, I've been on their site and I'm trying to find the raw data, but know where i can find yet the raw data there may, i'm sure there'll be a paper out eventually or there may already be that talks about levels and how they came up with the thresholds the research has got to be out there so i just i need to dive deeper on nexus lexus or something um one of my academic search engines or google academic but yeah they're not giving out raw data um and then how long does it take for the acid to dissipate from the animal? And I asked that question as well. And they said, once they clear and open up again, that they're assured that the acid has cleared from the body. Now, how right. many parts per million? It's not 100% dissipated, right? Once so, everything's 19 or lower, they're going right. to open. Right. And keep in mind that the... Domic acid is not in the meat, but you still are at risk. Well, if that, that's not the answer I ended up getting. It It's very, very low. It can get in there potentially. But from what I understand, on almost all toxins, lobster put it in their viscera, eggs everywhere and not in the meat. So if you're going to eat stuff, eat the meat, don't eat the rest of it. Uh, point. I would like to know what our, our numbers were. Like if it's two parts per million, zero parts per million, nothing detectable in Malibu, I feel much better. But they're not they're not giving us that data and they're being a little dodgy around being specific. And they may not know. That's part of it. But we'll get there eventually, I think. And then there's two questions about whether it's better to um, how to 
um, take care of them, like how to harvest them. I mean, is it better to brain the lobster and put it in the fridge overnight and then take it apart? Or should you freeze them first and then clean them? You know, like what's... I, I If I'm going to cook them within two or three days, I wrap them in or I put them in a, 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 like a, a plastic bag or even a paper bag, big shopping bag with a little moisture in it. Or if it gets wet, that's fine. And they'll live for multiple days in the fridge. And they like that 40 degree temperature quite well. And then I cook them. If I'm not going to cook them within a couple of days, I freeze them. I usually wrap them in one of the uh, round. The whole lobster grant. Whole lobster, put it in the base of the shopping bag, wrap the shopping bag around, slide it in the freezer, kind of swaddles them, I guess, for lack of a better term. And they they kind of just slowly lower temperature and freeze. It's For me, it's a humane way to dispatch them. And then you can either boil them whole. The nice thing about freezing them whole rather than just the tail is it's kind of its own freezer bag. So if you didn't knock off any limbs and it's still fully intact, they're going to freeze beautifully. And I've, I've froze for months and months and months just in the shit its own shell as a whole lobster, and they cook beautifully. Now, if you pull the tail off, I would probably either the best way is to immerse it in water and have a block of ice around it because then no oxygen gets to it and you'll avoid freezer burn. You can vacuum pack it, which will avoid freezer burn. But if you just put it in and you don't seal it as a tail, it will freezer burn and oxidize the meat and and wear out pretty quickly. So I wouldn't freeze them for probably more than a month or two if they're not intact. And then I often will boil, but I cut in half and barbecue. The meat's better on a kind of even heat, low and slow. So the best way is probably to sous vide them, which is a hot water bath at a constant temperature. And it brings it up to whatever temperature you want. It is seafood. So you're looking like 150, 160 degrees as a, as a chef <laughs> for food safety. And there's lots and lots of recipes out there on the internet. And you can do beautiful things searching with Google. So my favorite really is just drawn butter with garlic. And sometimes I'll do an oven, a parboil them to cook them a bit and do a bit of oven treatment to give kind of the, uh, what's the recipe called? Anyway, a, a oven, some breadcrumb type of thing. But I like I like the kind of seafood that's really purity based of just meat, a little, little butter, a little garlic, maybe some herbs, salt and pepper, just salt. And or I rather brine the water really and be pure about it. Our lobster, I believe, is very sweet. I like it better than the American lobster back east, but that's up to taste. I find ours more sweet than the traditional restaurant lobster. Well, our lobster, our restaurant lobster, here, but you know what I'm saying, the clawed lobster. Any other questions, Barbara? Uh, not that I see. Just come on off mute if you guys want to ask something. Totally cool. So I have a question. I know the eel can eat them when they're molting, but like, are there anything else that eats a lot besides us? Oh yeah. They're, they're, they're sharks that don't have teeth. <laughs> well, they have teeth, but they're like knuckles. And uh, the, the leopard and the, the big one is the horn shark. Well, loves to eat smaller lobster. They're not huge sharks. Leopard sharks can eat quite a big lobster. But the probably the biggest predator of them, besides mammals, is sheephead, which is the red, black, and white fish. They they're all pink. When they're well, it's a fascinating. We could do a whole talk just on sheephead, but sheepheads are ass. They all start as females. They have a dominant male female that turns to a male when the male goes missing. So they are uh, hermaphroditic. They can change from female to male. They don't change back. And when they go to the mail, they get a hump. They have a distinct white stripe and kind of black head. And the females tend to be all pink. But the big, big sheep head can get very, very big male sheep head can get quite large. And they have these big teeth on them. And they, they'll go in and chomp up. They can bite right through abalone shells, lobster carapaces. They generally eat invertebrates. It's what makes them, they're, they're like puppy dogs. So I don't really shoot them, but newer hunters tend to take them and they barbecue quite well and they make good fish soup because they eat lobster, right? So they're kind of shellfish tinged or treated or grown lobster. Uh, I mean, uh, fish. So the meat's pretty nice, but rats in general are just kind of neat and nice and 
I don't like shooting them. So I guess one question. That oh, oh, and <laughs> giant sea bass will definitely eat lobster because they can just yeah. suck them up. That's true. Um, the most frequent question we're asked about lobster, where do we go? Well, they can move like a mile a day, right? At least easily half a mile a day. So that's really tough. In Malibu, this is not everywhere in Southern California, but in Malibu, in the early part of the season, they tend to be extremely shallow. Has anybody been out for them yet? Where'd you go? Five feet of water in the yoga, in the surf grass? You're you're raising your head up and down, Alex. So I'm assuming that's an affirmative. Why don't you come off and you don't have to name the exact there spot. Is, there it is. Depth yeah. ranges. Yeah, it's generally between like four and maybe eight feet deep the most in the eelgrass, really close to yeah, shore. I've I've literally been scuba diving and switched to free diving because I all I gotta do is bend my waist. Um so those places have rocky, almost tide pooly type things at high tide. You'll you'll hit them this time of year. And then what I find is the sweet water. When we get rain, that sweet water pushes them deeper. So uh, the earlier the rains, the quicker they go deep, in my opinion. I don't have data for this, but I have a lot of hunting. So I generally find that in a rain, they're almost immediately out of 10 to 12 feet. And as it continues to rain and get colder, they head much deeper to the outer reefs, 30, 40 feet of water. So come February, they're almost always a long swim and in that 30, 40, even 100 foot range. At the islands, Catalina, especially, they start the season deep, tend to go shallower throughout the year. And then the rest of the islands, you just got to, you got to go check. Generally, Northern Channel Islands, pretty shallow this time of year, I found. I find it surf grass and spend most of my time just kind of my face below the surf grass, looking in the crevices, even during the day. But the bigger lobster are smarter. They've gotten away. They've been attempted to be predated on, maybe been released from, from traps. So they're smarter. They have a lot of experience and they tend to be really old. They'll hunker down in kind of a hole they go back to again and again and again. And they're usually the, the ones that you just can't reach and it's the perfect hole of all holes. So don't be surprised if the wilier and bigger the lobster get, the more impossible they are to catch. But they all come out at night. So that's why I'm a fan of the nocturnal diving. I love night diving anyway. It's my favorite time to dive. Hey, Grant, we got a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. One is, any tips on shark safety when diving with lobsters during don't the worry. night? Don't worry about it. They okay. don't care. And best one, tips? One, the, only, the only potentially dangerous shark I saw at night off of Point Doom, and she did not care about me at all. I swam in on the bottom all the way to about two inches of water. Now I would have hung out and been really impressed by it, but I was much younger and scared then. However, they you I'll guarantee you, and Nicole did a podcast with me, and I, I had talked about something I didn't talk about in a long time that I remember during that podcast. Put in perspective of all the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of times you've been in the water with sharks and never had anything happen. Because you have. You've had sharks around you. If you've dived here any number of times, you probably had juvenile white sharks that you didn't know were there, and probably mature white sharks. Never, ever have they done a darn thing. So you hear about it, it hits the newspaper, but you have double the, you can get struck by lightning twice before you hit the odds of getting bit by a shark. Five times greater chance of being killed by a feral pig in the United States. More chance of being killed in diving by bowling. And I would literally feel more comfortable strapping horse blood and meat to my body, pulling a jackass maneuver, and diving with great whites than driving to the boat to, to go do that. Yes, Barbara. Uh, another question, best tip for grabbing lobster. So I kind of gave it away. I tend to try to be as quiet as possible. I try to settle down and I'll shine my light away, usually in front of the lobster where I'm not. And then I breathe nice and slow. Sneak up in the shadow, so to speak. I grab with my left hand because I'm right-handed with the light. And I try to get as close to the middle of the lobster as possible. I can usually do it if I do it slow because they do have receptors for water movement. The thing is not get a current or push from your movement. Usually get within two or three inches of the of the mid part, and I just slam down as hard as I can and hold because they're going to fight vigorously. And if you don't really grab them, and generally the new diver tends to lose a few, that technique 
I bet about 950. I only lose about 120. During the day, it's much harder. So it's just being quick and being patient at night and finding them out and about. And that's why I kind of like to go later because they tend to chill out a little bit after they've fed up a bit. During the day, you just got to find the hole. I, I will see it there if it looks like it's nice size. I look for its back door. Oftentimes they have one in and out if they're younger. Pile up a few rocks at the back end or stick something there. And then bum rush them, like just go in the front. Or I can play with the antenna. And if you can grab the base of the antenna, you saw on the antenna that the base was very thick and heavy. The antenna itself will break, but the base of the antenna by the horns will not break. So if you can get that, you can work them side to side and up and down and, and pull them out front ways. Or if it's not a long back door, you literally can block the front, scare them a little bit, and be there with the back with your hand at the back door. And they literally just run into your hand and you grab the tail or the midsection and pull them out. But it's patience. It's it's really mileage. It's covering territory, and you kind of tend to find seven and limit out in the first ten minutes, or you spend the whole two hours diving if you're diving a big cylinder and diving in shallows. If you're going to do free diving, do it with a buddy. Uh, when it's really shallow, that's doable even as a snorkeler. If you're going to do that beyond that, get some training, take a class, always use a, a train safety buddy. Uh, and watch watch your intervals on diving because carrying covering a lot of territory, you tend to want to dive a lot and don't overweight yourself because in shallow water, it's tough if you're buoyant and need to be buoyant. Yes, Barbara? Any issues with sea lions taking your lobster bag? Not really. They tend not to like get that close. I guess if it was really aggressive, they might take it out of your hand. But they generally don't eat lobster. They're more of a fish species. So I think if you gave it to them, they might be interested, but they might play with it more than eat it. Unless it's a soft shell lobster, they're not going to be able to tell the difference. They probably think it's too much work and it's hard to chew through, but they could do it with a small lobster. I've never, ever in thousands of dives for lobster ever had a sea lion. That's the thing they generally are wonderful and play with me. There's occasion where a juvenile male will be a bit aggressive and that's more just about posture dominance. Yes, Barbara. So I've actually had a giant sea bass try to get my bag. So I have had that. Yeah, happen. giant sea bass, giant sea bass is a different equation. They know what they are and yeah. they, they will suck the whole bag in. So yeah, they like kind of like approached careful. me and it was like either I give them one or they were going to take my bag. Yeah, there, so, there's a particular giant sea bass at Latigo that's very aggressive. Yep, that's the guy. And he's a robber. And he's yep. probably a teenage sea bass, so he's angsty as well. Another question. Chance of getting bit by lobster if you grab the wrong way when reaching in the hole? You're not going to get bit. There are no claws on lobster in California. However, you can get – there are pretty big horns on the tail. And if you're going barehanded or you have fingerless gloves, I've been speared by the tail spike, but that's why we wear a good glove, something that's good and durable, thin neoprene. I, I like the kind of sailing glove or leather palmed gloves because they're, they're really good at, at deflecting those big spikes. But that's it's more annoying to get your fingers, if they're fingerless, scratched up by the little spines because that hurts when you wash your hands and get the lemon on it that you're trying to use with the drawn butter. Ah, <laughs> that kind of hurts more than the scratches do is the acid in the wound, but use good so, gloves. That's my recommendation. And don't grab them by the tail, grab them by the body. Well, we grab by the middle. However, you're yeah. going to grab by the tail sometimes. And then it just let it flex and try not to get your fingers really tight around it. I tend to hold the tail. If it's in the tail, the, and those fans don't have any spikes near them and it will curl around my fist but I don't get spiked. And if it's big, it may, the tail may be wider than your fist. So it's good. But if you get, if you get it on it flat and it curls around, those spikes can do some damage. So best to grab by the carapace. I, I shoot for the middle. So you may be by some spikes, but good gloves will take care of you. You may get a little bit of a pinch injury, but you're not going to get speared. It's worth investing in. We had Kevlar palm gloves. Are there still Kevlar palm gloves? There that's are. Worth the, that's worth the extra 30 bucks. And, I would even take neoprene cement and build a three or four coats up and then some talc on the fingertips just because even, even Kevlar will wear down in a season. So I had 
I have my Kevlar gloves, probably still have them, that last almost indefinitely because I build up the seams with neoprene, the black neoprene cement. I wouldn't use Aqua Seal because it looks like you have big ass nasal nudibranchs on your hands and it's ugly and they it's less flexible. And the clear glue is looks like snot as well. So it's just not as pretty. I like to use the black. Sorry, Barbara. I'm teaching them how not to buy, wear out their gear. That's good. Any, Any other questions? questions? Open, the floor is open. Well, we'll give you back your evening and uh, we can cut the cut the recording, I think, and we'll stick around a little bit more. So if you want to ask something without all the people here, you can stick around uh, or we'll say goodnight.